I've got a lot of 45 degree miters and bevels on the table saw, and if there's one thing I've learned, is that setup is only half the challenge. Sure, your blade has to be tilted to a precise 45 degree angle, and your fence must be perfectly parallel to that blade. If you screw one of those things up, you're going to have a bad day. But perhaps the greatest challenge is consistently feeding the boards straight through the cut. If you allow your workpiece to drift away from the fence at all, if your fence deflects a tiny bit, or if you pause mid-cut, you may get gaps in your assembled joint. I'm not saying you can't do it at the table, so I've done it plenty of times. I'm just saying it can be a fussy process, and perhaps a router table might be a better tool for some jobs. Think about it. A 45 degree chamfer bit can't be set to the wrong angle. The bit cuts at a single point, so the fence doesn't have to be parallel to anything. And it's easier to keep your work firmly against a router table fence as you cut because you can use feather boards to apply pressure in places that might lead to a serious kickback if you did it at the table saw. These advantages can lead to straighter, more consistent bevels at the router table, both on the edge of a workpiece and on its ends. But there are some techniques involved, and that's what we'll discuss in this video. To begin with, the 45 degree chamfer bit you have in your collection probably won't work to form a full bevel on three quarter inch thick stock. That bit's designed to add slight chamfers to ease the edges of work pieces, not to cut away a complete edge. The cutting length is only about 7 16 of an inch, so unless your boards are thinner than that, you'll need a larger bit. This one has more than an inch of cutting length, so it will handle 3 quarter inch and even 1 inch thick stock. Admittedly, it is a bigger, more expensive hunk of metal than the other bit. But since bevels and miters are very common cuts, I think that the larger bit is worth the investment. I'll link to the one I use below this video. Now since this bit is capable of removing the entire edge from my workpiece, I have to consider how the fence will guide the board on the exit side of the cut. For example, if the bit removes too much of the edge, a gap will appear between the fence and what remains of the board. At the beginning of the cut, this won't matter much because the uncut portion of the board is still running on the infeed side of the fence, and that'll support the workpiece. But eventually, you're going to reach a tipping point where a shift will occur to close the gap on the outfeed side and open a gap on the infeed side. This shift can leave a mark on your beveled edge, and you will get some nasty snipe as the bit exits the cut on the end of the workpiece. There are two solutions to this problem. The first is to set the bit height so the bottom corner is just above the surface of the table. Then set the fence so the bit will cut almost, but not entirely, to the top of the workpiece. This will leave a flat portion at the top of the bevel, which can ride against your fence and support the cut. Of course, you'll want a crisper, more knife-like edge. So move the fence back a tiny bit more and make another cut. The goal is to incrementally reduce that flat edge to a hair's width without removing it entirely. It may take a couple test cuts, but once you get your fence dialed in, you can lock it down and then cut all of your work pieces. The second method is less fussy, but it's perhaps only practical for shorter work pieces because it involves using some double-sided tape to attach a scrap piece of wood to the top of your project part. This guide board will run against the fence so you can remove the entire edge of your workpiece beneath in a single pass. Note how both these methods led to a crisper cut. Here, I'm cutting across the grain on some veneered plywood and I'm removing the entire edge. This is a worst case scenario because that thin outer veneer is so delicate and you can see how I got fuzzy fibers along my sharp edge. If I employ our first method, which left that tiny blunt edge, I don't disturb the delicate veneer, and my cut is much crisper. That blunt edge, if it's very fine, won't be noticeable after you sand your assemble joint anyway. On the other hand, if I employed our second method by applying a guide strip above the workpiece, it will help support those delicate fibers beneath it even if I do cut away the entire edge. Now this type of tear out is mostly an issue when cutting across the grain of veneered plywood or with some really chip out prone hardwoods. You may not have to be so careful on most solid woods, but keep these tips in mind just in case. Also note how the feather boards on my fence hold the workpiece down on the table while my hands push it toward the fence and guide it forward through the cut. You could add feather boards on the tabletop to push toward the fence as well if your workpiece is narrow enough. As I said, the ability to apply consistent pressure 
wherever you need it, is one of the biggest advantages of using a router table for this task. So I recommend employing feather boards wherever you can. Cutting bevels on the end of a narrow workpiece presents an additional challenge because you have to keep the piece perpendicular to the fence as you cut. One of the simplest ways to do this is with a pusher made from a wider piece of scrap wood. The pusher has the added function of also supporting the fibers on the trailing edge of your workpiece so the router bit won't leave splinters as it exits the cut. This is a far greater concern when I'm cutting a board's end across the grain than if I was routing the edge with the grain. You must take care to hold the workpiece firmly against the edge of the pusher so it doesn't slip towards the bit as you cut. This is especially true if the piece is narrower than the opening in your fence. You might even glue a strip of sandpaper to the edge of your pusher to grip the edge of your board. With proper care, you can make very accurate cuts using this method at the router table as opposed to the table saw. But this inevitably leads to the question of whether this is practical for mitering the corners of moldings and picture frames. The answer is maybe. It depends on the shape of the molding. If its profile doesn't prevent you from laying it flat on the table, then perhaps. But the shape of the profile may also make it difficult for your pusher to support the fibers as they exit the cut, and you may end up with some nasty tear up. So for profiled moldings, I still recommend a table saw and a good miter gauge or a sled, or a well-tuned and accurate miter saw with a fine tooth blade. I hope these lessons add to your woodworking knowledge and make your future projects that much better. We'll see you next time. Featherboards improve the quality and safety of table saw and rotor table cuts if you use them. Hedgehog featherboards are designed to be easier to use. With a single knob and one-handed operation for quick adjustments, there are no more excuses. Check them out at the link below this video.